There are two final leaders left to discuss in our series, Shapililiuma II and Corinta. But before we look at these Hittite kings, there are a good number of people wondering just what is a Hittite. Even if you've heard of the word, probably from the biblical references, many don't know how remarkable their history or historical situation was. And that is fair enough. It is a bit less sexy than ancient Egypt, far less ancient or enduring. But though it's a candle that burns quicker, it burns in its own way far brighter. I will say at the start that this episode and the next are just summaries designed to give you a feel for the people more than anything so that you can jump into Total War Pharaoh and either play as the Hittite kings or battle against them and know where they're coming from. If you want a fuller picture of the Hittite history, check out the playlist in the video description because our main Oldest Stories podcast spent 23 episodes on their political history alone. And if you want an even deeper dive, Trevor Bryce has a two-volume set called Kingdom of the Hittites and Life and Society in the Hittite World that are quite well written despite being rather academic and cover both political military history as well as the actual lifestyles common in ancient Anatolia. Now our story begins in the Middle Bronze Age, around the 1800s BCE in Anatolia. That's the great rectangle of modern Turkey, though of course there are no Turks there yet. Urbanization is ancient in this region, but the geography is harsh, and there are no great cities like we see in Egypt and Mesopotamia at the same time. It's a patchwork of ethnicities, towns, and tiny communities, prevented from uniting by a broken terrain and a mutual desire to not be dominated by outsiders. In this era, Assyria has entered the picture. Now, a millennium later, Assyria entering your territory is a terrifying military prospect. But in the 1800s, Assyria was not a military giant, but rather it was the world's first mercantile empire with joint stock companies, economic franchises, long-distance caravans, and economic colonies running perhaps as far as Afghanistan in the east to Cyprus in the west. But most of their greatest economic activity took place in the towns of Anatolia. Into this environment come a number of Indo-European groups as part of the great Indo-European migration, which also brings horses and more powerful chariots into the region. Of course, I'm summarizing a lot here. I should probably mention the Kassites and Mitanni in this migration, but I won't, and instead focus on a single small group that makes its way to Anatolia. This group of warriors ends up in west-central Anatolia and takes a modest-sized town for themselves, or perhaps settles the land and founds a town. The timeline for these early guys is poorly understood, but a fellow named Pitana leads this small group and makes his fame by conquering the nearby town of Nesha which is significant because it has one of the greatest Assyrian trade colonies in it, the colony of Kanesh. So suddenly his dynasty is one of the most wealthy and powerful in the region. Now it's from that town and region that these people get their name. They speak the language of Nesha, or Neshili, and this would be the language of the entire dynasty. It's important to remember that these people were never in their own opinion, called Hittites. The name Hittite comes from the Bible and describes a very different people. They are descendants, ultimately, of Pitana, but after multiple transformations in their culture, politics, and character, they become the what's called the Neo-Hittites, sometimes the Post-Hittites, and sometimes the Biblical Hittites, different in a lot of ways that we'll look at later. Pithana's son Anita would build a pretty impressive kingdom in a single generation, stretching along the most important rivers of central Anatolia all the way to the Black Sea. But this empire collapsed with his death. Most importantly, Anita conquered a city called Hattusha, famous as the Hittite capital, but at this point he didn't actually occupy it. 
he actually burned it down and laid a curse on whoever would rebuild the city. Now, after an uncertain number of generations later, we get to King Labarna, whose records don't survive, but was somehow significant enough that all later Hittite kings would take the title Labarna in honor of him, the way Roman emperors were all called Caesar, even long after the dynasty of the Caesars had been replaced. His son was Hattushili, the second great empire builder after Anita. He gets his name because he took over the destroyed city of Hattusha and rebuilds it, defying the curse because the city location is actually an extremely defensible fortress, and that's just the sort of thing a military man like Hattushili wants in a city. Of course, it will turn out that the true bite of the curse is that it makes a horrible location for managing the later Hittite Empire, nestled in some very poor terrain that makes all later logistics and trade in and out of the capital a huge pain. Plus, the agriculture isn't great. But on the plus side, if anything does go wrong, you can always just blame the curse, and suddenly it isn't your fault anymore. Anyway, Hattushili is a great conqueror. He starts by consolidating central Anatolia, which is called the Land of Hatti, on which the Hattians live. These Hattians spoke an Anatolian language called Hattian, and they probably also wore hats, though not silly hats, just sort of plain caps, like a ball cap without the brim. Now this kingdom, which we call the Hittites, is going throughout the rest of history to be called by their contemporaries the Land of Hatti, after this geographical heartland. The fact that they are ruled by a non-Hattian dynasty and later undergo strong cultural shifts into Hurrian and Luwian never really matters in terms of what they get called. And even after the empire collapses into a few scattered Syrian cities, they'll still be called the people of Hatti, which the Israelites, Israelites are going to mispronounce in the Bible as Hittites. But Hattushili doesn't just conquer the core of Anatolia. He also extends his conquests out to the rich trade cities of Syria, and in the process becomes extremely wealthy. He was, it seems, trying to replicate the conquests of the famous Sargon of Akkad, but from the other side of the map, and he did a pretty good job of it too, though he did die before making it into Mesopotamia. His grandson, Mershali, continued his father, grandfather's dream of rebuilding the Akkadian Empire with one of the most remarkable military campaigns of the ancient world, marching all the way from Anatolia to the city of Babylon. He laid siege to it, ended the dynasty of Hammurabi, and marched much of the city back as plunder and slaves all the way to Hattusha. Crossing the map like this is a feat of logistics and ambition that really can't be understated, and this alone secures Mershali's place as one of the top ancient conquerors. But then, a few years later, Mershali was killed in a palace coup, and the empire fell apart completely, leaving nothing but Hattusha and a bit of territory nearby, as nearly a century passed in which the Hittite leaders were unable to kill anyone but, it seems, each other. One fellow, Telepanu, does show up in this period and attempts to bring some reform by, among other things, outlawing royal assassinations, but then he gets assassinated, and the cycle continues. The Hittite kingdom, historically, is divided into four sections. The Old Kingdom ends with Mershali's death, and this muddling mess of assassination is called the Middle Kingdom, generally regarded as a low point of Hittite history. The New Kingdom period begins around 1400 BCE with Tudhalia, who finally stabilized things and is the third empire builder, conquering a good chunk of Anatolia, including the western portion around the famous city of Troy. 
His son Arnawanda would then proceed to be overrun on all sides, especially in the north by the barbarian Cascans of the mountainous Pontus and Caucasus regions and the Hurrians of the west, destroying the empire once again. His son, another Tudhalia, would do even worse, dying with even the heartland having been overrun. He probably died in battle trying to defend it, so he wasn't a complete putz, but he did lose. His successor was another Tudhalia, but this guy was then murdered by the absolute best Hittite leader of all time, Shipililiuma. And it is Sh. Pililiuma. I've heard the Total War people calling him Sipililiuma. That's wrong. Shipililiuma began his reign with nothing but an army. Even the capital had been sacked and proceeded to reconquer the heartland from basically nothing, and then reconquered pretty much everything that Hattushili had taken, but against much steeper resistance, taking all of western Anatolia and then into the wealthy cities of Syria. He put the Hittites on the map as a major player of the Late Bronze Age. There was even an unprecedented attempt by the Egyptian court to have Shabiliuma's son come and rule Egypt as a foreign pharaoh, which shows just how bad of shape Egypt was in at this point following the death of King Tut. But Shabiliuma's son is murdered by a rival Egyptian faction on his way down forever changing Egyptian history and ensuring that the next century would be dominated by Egyptian Hittite military rivalry, mostly playing out with battle after battle on the border between the two lands in the Levant. Shapililiuma eventually died, and in a first for the Hittite Empire, it doesn't collapse in the following generation. That took four tries, possibly five depending on how you count it, but the empire will now endure, at least until the Bronze Age collapse. Anyway, the initial successor dies pretty quickly, the victim of a massive plague that's going to endure for something like 20 years and kill maybe two-thirds of the people in the Hittite heartland over that time. It's a bit worse than COVID. The king during that plague, Mershili, has some famous prayers, which were written down and still exist and are pretty well written. But also he did a decent job of keeping the Hittites still powerful during that difficult period. However, here is where we start to run into some of the things that make the Hittite Empire unique in the Late Bronze Age. Unlike the Mesopotamian kingdoms or Egypt, Anatolia always struggled against depopulation. Not only is the land agriculturally poorer in terms of total calories per acre, it's also far more weather dependent, susceptible to both hard winters and hard summers that can both wipe out an entire crop for a season or completely dry out most of the rivers. This leads to regular famines and a lower overall carrying capacity of the land. One way the people of Anatolia responded to this was through crop diversity. Each farmer would typically own a larger number of smaller plots than his Mesopotamian or Egyptian counterparts, and those fields would grow a larger number of different kinds of foods something even more enabled by the greater eco-diversity of Anatolia in general. This is in contrast to the mostly wheat and barley grown by the majority of river-fed farms in the Nile and Euphrates valleys. This did mean that when times were good, Anatolian farmers enjoyed far more food diversity, giving them a reputation for being larger and healthier in general because you get in all your vitamins. Plus, when times were bad, only some out of your wider crop rotation was likely to fail, meaning that you wouldn't be completely ruined for the year unless things were really bad. But that lack of specialization also meant that far fewer calories per acre could be grown, limiting populations compared to the other Bronze Age powers. But I have been talking about the people of Anatolia, and I want to be very clear that even when the Hittite Empire was at one of its many peaks, very few people were 
ethnically part of the ruling class. Anatolia was hugely diverse in languages, ethnicities, and people groups, featuring Hattians, Luwians, Hurrians, Kaskans, Semitic peoples, Lucans, Palayans, and many more, each of these getting locally subdivided at times as well. And a key feature of the empire was that most of these people were largely left to self-govern, making the Hittite Empire a patchwork of separate peoples and even faiths who all happened to pay taxes and send soldiers to Hattusha, and far less centralized than Egypt, Babylon, or Assyria were at around the same time. This is part of why the empire could grow so big so fast. There weren't a lot of transition costs to taking over a new land, but also why it was so easy for it to fall apart so fast as well. This also played a big role in their competition with Egypt over the cities of Canaan, but it also doesn't really fit in a typical total war conception of how territory is held. But as Mershali's plague slowly ebbs away, we are around the year 1295 BCE, 90 years prior to the start date of Total War Pharaoh and at the height of Hittite power. Things are going to mostly plateau over the next century, and in the next episode, The Fall of the Hittites, we're going to look at their development as a major power, the court struggles that laid the foundation for Corinthus' conflict with Shapilaliuma, and the thing that makes Hittite militaries more flexible than other ancient armies. Then there will be a pair of episodes on the two faction leaders. So make sure you like and subscribe for that, and leave a comment below with questions or anything you think I should cover on the Hittites more specifically, since I'm necessarily glossing over a ton of stuff to keep things manageable. Anyway, the Hittites are great, you should definitely play them in Total War Pharaoh, and until it comes out, thank you for watching.